And we're going to read verse, uh, we're going to read verse 22. Matthew 14, 22. We're going to be talking about, and then after we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 37, we're going to be talking about challenged to believe. Challenged to believe. If you could stand on your feet with me, let's do this reading together uh, um, and just uh, stand for the reading of the Word of God today. Um, I really, I feel so strongly about this, this word I believe God is going to speak with you today. I was powerfully challenged by this this thought. And um, I feel like God is going to, a few things are going to break free in your life today. There's going to be some breakthrough today in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, amen. Am I the only one who believes that? I don't think so. All right, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, it says, uh, <clears throat> I just had it. My, my iPad is playing games on me. Matthew 14, 22. All right, it says, e- Oh my God, again. I had it right in front of me, and then it disappeared. Here we go. Immediately, Jesus and his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Say, the wind was contrary. contrary. Say it louder. Say, the wind wind was contrary. contrary. Yeah, the wind was contrary. There are a lot of things that go against you in your journey. The wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command, uh, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. When those who were in the boat came Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 37 quickly. Ezekiel chapter 37. These passages will seem like they have have nothing to do with each other. Um, But I'll be challenged today to find a common denominator. Amen? Amen. Ezekiel 37 says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were many, very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live again? (laughs) I love this question. This question, this is where we're going to spend most of our time today. So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Ooh, my God. My God. I want you to turn to your neighbor. And I I want you to ask him or her. And I just want you to say, 
Do you believe? Come on, turn to your neighbor and ask him. Do you believe these bones can live again? Hallelujah. All right, Father God, thank you for your wonderful presence in this place. We, we give you praise. We give you honor. Thank you for the reading of your word. Bless it today and apply it to our lives, God. May our hearts be open to receive the powerful seed of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Wonderful. Have a seat. You can have a seat. Today we're talking about being challenged to believe. Dared to believe. The first passage we read in, in, in Matthew chapter 14 is a very well-known passage where Jesus was ministering to the multitudes until the evening was coming upon them. And Jesus uh, commanded his disciples to cross to the other side of the sea. And this is the Sea of Galilee. It was much, much like a lake, uh, but crossing over to the other side. It was a large, large, large lake. Jesus would stay behind to pray, and the disciples would get on the boat. Jesus would go up to the mountain. He would begin to pray. And overnight, as Jesus was praying, the disciples were crossing that large body of water and they were uh, they, they, they met with a storm uh, uh, and that's the, that's where the whole thing seems to go south because everything was 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 good about that day they felt very accomplished they, they, they had a, an effective day they had a, a productive day they had served a lot of people they had uh, uh, so many things going right for them during that day Jesus had done some wonderful miracles and, and and they had seen the power of God in in operation and just wonderful things happening you know when you have a good day when you have a very very good day you're proud of yourself. You're proud of how much, how much you were able to accomplish. And you, you had just an overall good day. You know those overall good days? You know, just this past, um, this, not this, yeah, this Friday, we had you now with the young adults. And I, I asked them, you know, what was your win this week? And somebody said, oh, there was some, something to do with work. We, we received a big shipment of, of things, and it was today. And uh, my coworker and I were able to put everything away in record time. And, and, and it, was, it was an overall good day. It was just a good day. You know, it's, there are little things you do that make you feel like you had a good day. You know what I'm talking about? And they had this, this feeling. They, they had a good, good day. But lo and behold, they are met with a storm. They are met with a storm. And storms are sometimes unannounced in life, particularly. They are unannounced. Storms can come on any day of the week, on any time of day, any month of the year. It, it comes on, 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 on every, every type of season. Storms come and they are unannounced. And they sometimes just, just hit you in the face, you know, because... Storms don't care if you're having a good day or not. Storms don't care if you're having a good week or not. Storms don't even care if you're having a good season overall, if everything is going right. Storms don't care about that. Storms just hit you. Sometimes you get hit in the mouth with just a big unexpected storm. And the disciples were facing that particular uh, uh, predicament where they were facing a storm and Jesus was not in the boat. They begin to be afraid. And mind you, they're not inexperienced people when it comes to the sea and the waters. You're talking about fishermen who are used to being out in the sea, out in the open, who are used to dealing with storms, and they were afraid. Now think of that for a little bit. If they were inexperienced people and had never been on a boat before, I'd really understand that maybe it wasn't that big of a storm. Maybe they were exaggerating it a little bit, and they, it, maybe it was just a little bit of a strong wind. But no, 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 no. These guys were experienced fishermen who were afraid because they were in the kind of storm that they could not control. They could not tame the type of storm they were going through. Now think of that for a little bit. 
Think back in your life, the types of storms you've been through that you could not tame. The types of storms that hit you in the face and, and, and come up unexpectedly that you have no idea what to do. And instead of you controlling your boat, the waters control it and you don't know really where you're going. That was the kind of situation they were in. When all of a sudden they look out far and there's, there's this, this, this silhouette of a man walking towards them, walking on the water. And they were afraid. They, one turned to another and said, whoa, it's a ghost. It's, it's a ghost. What's that? Is, that, is, is it a plane? Is it, is it, no, it's Superman. No, it's, what is it exactly? And Jesus, from afar, he says, don't be afraid. It's me. Now, in that moment, Peter does something that is striking. You know, a lot of people talk about Peter because he sank, but we very rarely give him credit because he actually took some steps on top of the water. And Peter, in an act of boldness, cried out to Jesus from the inside of the boat, and he said, Jesus, if it's really you, bid me to come, command me to come, and I'll step out of this boat into, into the water, and I'll come to you. And Jesus says, all right. Come on down, Peter. Peter steps out of the boat, put his foot on top of the, uh, each one of the, the hydrogen molecules with the two oxygen mo molecules. And Peter steps on the water and he starts to go in the direction where Jesus was. When all of a sudden, the text describes this in a very special way to me. And I want to, before going into Ezekiel, because I want to show you there's a common denominator between these two passages. I want to read to you one more time what happens after he is experiencing this miracle. Now remember what. Remember the context of this whole situation. After having a wonderful, productive, special day, these guys are finding themselves uh, in, in a terrible situation, in this, this strong storm they could not tame. They were afraid for their lives. Now, this man is doing something he never thought was possible before. He is walking on top of the water. Now, think of that type of experience. And in the middle of that, Matthew chapter 14, verse 29 says this. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind... When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. So the instant that Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and began to notice what was around him, he began to sink. Now, what I find amazing is that he cried out to Jesus, because Jesus is always there. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, Jesus is always there when you need him. Come on, come on, say it again, because I feel like your neighbor needs to hear that right now. Tell somebody else, say, Jesus is always there when you need him. He's always there when you need him. The Bible says that Jesus was there, and he took Peter, and he, he brought him up, and he brought him into the boat. And they were, how do you think they went back to the boat, by the way? Huh? They walked back to the boat. That's right. Peter was walking back with Jesus. What I find amazing is that Jesus doesn't congratulate Peter. If it was me, that's what I would have done. Some encouragement there. Right? Like, hey, buddy, you sank, but hey, those steps, huh? Oh, that was tight. That was, that was, you did a good job, my friend. You did a good job. No, no, no. Jesus doesn't even acknowledge the fact that Peter walked on water. Jesus immediately tells him, oh, Peter, you have little faith. 
why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Now this question, and this, this is the setup for today. This question is interesting to me because my first instinct would be to congratulate Peter. But the thing is, Jesus reprimands Peter, but he says nothing to the other 11 guys who remained in the boat in the first place. Why, why would Jesus reprimand Peter, but not the other 11 guys? Because if, if Peter was of little faith and he got to walk, imagine the other 11. You know, imagine the other 11 who stayed tucked away in the boat, afraid for their lives. If, if it was me, if, if I were Jesus, I'm definitely not because I believe Jesus had hair. If, but if I were Jesus... I would have congratulated Peter and I would have told the other 11, you see guys, you see what happens when you're afraid and you stay in the boat? You see, that's what happens. You don't get to experience these wonderful things. But Jesus didn't do that. And I've, I've always questioned why. I've always questioned why. And, and while I was reading this passage this morning again and again and again and again, the Holy Spirit just, just whispered something into my heart. And hear me out here. I believe that the fact that Peter experienced a little bit of the supernatural... Gave him the ability to see what the others couldn't see. The fact that Peter sank after experiencing walking on water put him at a deficit. The other 11. They could not have believed to, they couldn't have felt what Peter felt while he was walking on the water. Because they, they never took that first step. But they never extended their faith to that point. And therefore, there was no regression. On Peter's end, it was a little different. Peter stepped out and expanded his faith to the point where he experienced something supernatural and extraordinary. But in the middle of it, he regressed. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you follow what I'm saying? And that regression is what Jesus reprimanded. It was the regression. Because, listen to this. There are certain things that we are no longer allowed to do after we experience a certain depth in God. There are certain regressions we cannot make any longer after we experience after we have certain experiences with God, after we experience a certain depth in God, we can no longer, there are certain things we can no longer do after we learn some portions of the word, after we see what God can do, after, after you've walked a little bit, you can no longer sink. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you follow what I'm saying? So it's, what happened to Peter was a regression. It was that, Peter gained spiritual ground and then gave it right back. I remember um, in one of my, I've, I've had several surgeries on my right knee because I'm an extremely high level athlete. It was, it's unbelievable what, I, what I'm able to do on the field or the court or wherever for that matter. <laughs> it's tragic. In my very first surgery, I, I was new to the whole surgery, or to the whole surgery experience. Now I'm an old, seasoned, seasoned man. 
But in my first surgery, my doctor, Dr. Nicoletta at the time, I don't believe he's even any longer in Boston, but a great doctor. And he operated on my knee for the first time. And he played a joke on me uh, when, I was, when I was waking up. Him and my father were standing by, before I went under uh, anesthesia. Uh, he came with a marker, with a, uh, like a marker, a pen or something. And he marked up my knee. And, and, and I, I was, I was kind of drowsy. I was, I was almost going out. And, he, and I asked him, what, what, are you, what are you doing? And he said, no, we're marking it to make sure we don't operate on the wrong knee. And they actually do that. They, they actually do that because apparently those things have happened. So, so he marked my knee, my leg, to make sure they would operate on the right leg. And I went under. And several hours later, I, they brought me back from anesthesia. And I woke up, and my father and, and my doctor were side by side on, on, around the bed with a very concerned look on their face. And I woke up, and I was still a little drowsy. I was like, what's going on? What's going on? And my dad turned to me and said, you know, they didn't see the markings, and, and they, they operated on the wrong knee. And I couldn't feel anything, like, below my waist. They operated on the wrong knee, and the doctor was like, yeah, yeah, but we, we, you were very well under, and you, you had good anesthesia, so we went ahead and we operated the other knee right away. And I was like, whoa, what? What's going on? Both of my legs were cut up. And they, they played this terrible prank and this horrible joke on me. I had the right knee operated on, thankfully. What happened in, in, in my first, uh, uh, during the, the recovery, w w the way they, at least the way they used to do it, I don't know if they do it like that now, but the way they used to do it is they fill up your knee with water, and the whole operation happens in water inside the knee. And because of that, the joint retains a lot of fluid, and there's a lot of moving around, there's a lot of a lot of tissue being damaged and whatnot, and, and, and the, the knee swells up very good. And what happens is because you have new ligaments there now, your knee is very stiff, and, and it takes a while before the body absorbs that graft, the new tissue that is being placed there. And you need to go to physical therapy for you to, for you to get back the range of motion you used to have. There's a certain range of motion. There's extension. It's, a, I think, negative... There's a ne negative degree because your leg does a little bit, bends downward a little bit. And then there's the range of motion going, going down and bending it back. And, and the physical therapy is, is that. It's just getting your range of motion back and strengthening your muscles because the muscles atrophy. And one leg is skinny, the other leg is n normal, and it's weird. And it takes a while for you to get it back. My first operation, I didn't really value physical therapy a whole lot. And it was a problem. It was a big problem because I went for the first two weeks and I thought I was good. I didn't need it anymore. So I stopped going on my own. And what happened was I had gained a certain range of motion, but because I stopped going, I lost the range of motion that I had gained. Do you follow what I'm saying? So I was able to bend my knee, let's say 90 degrees, and then I stopped going. I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm good from here on out. And I stopped going. And what happened was I began to lose my range of motion because I, didn't, I wasn't doing it properly. I don't know what happened. And I lost my range of motion. And then I had to go back to the therapist and say, listen, I've, I'm no longer gaining range of motion. I'm losing range of motion. And they said, okay, now because it's been, a longer, it's been longer since your surgery, we're going to have to put you on a machine that forces your leg to stretch those ligaments and force it down and bend it for you. The machine will bend it for you. And it was harder for me to get the range of motion that I had lost back rather than if I had just continued on the therapy. Do you, know, you follow what I'm saying? Is that, is that too complicated? I don't think so. Is that good? So it was so painful. So painful. It's so painful to get it back. Why? Because I had gained it and then I lost it. I had gained it and I lost it. The experience with, between Peter and Jesus, I think it has to do a lot with that. It's gaining spiritual ground and then losing it. 
You know, there are a few things that once you experience from God, you cannot go back. You can't go back. How do you go back to sinking when you've had the experience to walk on water? What I feel like Jesus was reprimanding Peter on, it was, Peter, how could you look at the wind after experiencing walking on water? How could you allow yourself to do that? I understand the other 11 guys who stayed in the boat. They never got to have the experience you had. For them to just continue to look at the wind, that was their norm. It was on their level. But you, you got to walk. Why did you take your eyes off of me? There are some things that we are not allowed to fall back to. Oh my God, after we've experienced some things, after we've learned some things, after we've felt some things, after we know and we've felt the power of the word of God, the power of forgiveness, the power of mercy, the power of grace, the power of God in operation in our lives, we cannot allow ourselves to fall back to what we used to know. We cannot do it. Let me ask you something. When God is talking, when God is talking to uh, the church, Jesus is, is, is asking John to write to the church in Laodicea, in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says to the Laodicean church, he says, listen, I, I've, I, I detest those who are lukewarm. I'd rather if you were either hot or cold, because lukewarm people, lukewarm Christians, I, th I throw them up. I can't stand lukewarm people. Now think of that for a little bit. What is something that is lukewarm? It's something that got heat up and it was allowed to cool down. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's, it's gaining, gaining ground and then losing the ground that you gained. And then when Peter was sinking and he says, save me, Jesus. And Jesus brings him up and then Jesus says to him, he says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In other words, I understand why the other 11 guys doubted, but I don't understand why you doubted. Because the other 11 guys, they haven't experienced what you have. Why? Why did you doubt? Now, the reason why I read Ezekiel 37, and what I, what I find, the, the common denominator that I find between these two passages is the challenge. There is a challenge to believe. There is a challenge here to believe. And when we're talking about the basics of spirituality, we're talking about the life of a disciple of Jesus. It's a challenge to believe daily. We are challenged to believe extraordinary things, supernatural things. It's a challenge to believe. By coming here today, by listening to the sermon, by, by uh, when you're in the privacy of your own home and you have the faith to get into your room, to bow down on your knees and talk to somebody you can't see or audibly hear back, and you're doing all of this by faith, it's a challenge to believe. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's a challenge to believe. The, the, previous, the previous messages we've been through, we talked about prayer life. We've talked about worship. Uh, last week, Pastor Murillo spoke about having a passion for Christ, a passion for Jesus. Uh, we, we've, we've been talking about these things. All of these things are challenges to believe. 
We're being challenged to believe in great and wonderful and mighty things. Things that we have never experienced before, maybe. Things that we, we don't even have examples of in current culture and in our society. Things that even our current climate frowns upon because they think it's ridiculous. We are challenged to believe these things every single day. Every single day. And what's, what's impressive about it is just like Peter was challenged to believe he could walk on water, Ezekiel was challenged in his vision to believe that those dry bones could come back to life. And it's the same challenge. It's a challenge to believe. And I want to share this with you today. I want to share with you today that you are being challenged to believe. As a disciple of Christ, you are being challenged to believe. And you are being challenged in the level of your spiritual experience. And that is why it's so important for us to gather together, for us to... to reflect on the scriptures for us to worship Christ for us to each day take a step further and deeper into the knowledge of who he is and that's why the scriptures say it says in in, in the book of the prophet Hosea the, the the Bible says you we need to know and continue to pursue the knowledge of God in other words I need to continue to step towards knowing more and more and more about who God is because as I have a deeper experience Experience, I am challenged further to believe in greater things. We are being challenged to believe. We are being challenged to believe. We're being challenged to believe. Now, these two challenges, the challenge that Peter had was a challenge to do something he had, he had never done. And Peter was in, was, in, was in his environment. The sea was his environment. Peter was a fisherman. And I, 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 now listen, listen to this. I believe God is challenging some of us today to believe in extraordinary things in places we're used to dealing with. Does, does that make sense to you? Because Peter was accustomed to the sea. It was his job. It was his profession. He was used to dealing with the water. He was used to dealing with fish. And it, it came to a point of, of such, of, of such a, a deep level of experience between Peter and Jesus, where Jesus challenged Peter to believe that he could take a step further in that same environment to experience a supernatural thing in the realm that he was used to living in. Now, I, I, let me try to break this down to you, is... Think of the areas of life and the places of life that you are used to, to be in. Whether it's your workplace, whether it's your family, your relationships, your friends, regardless of what it is. I believe God is challenging you to believe a supernatural thing in the middle of what is common to you. The sea was common to Peter. What is common to you? What is common to you? Peter was in the sea every day. It was his nine to five. What is common to you? Where are you every day? Because the place that is common to us is the place we don't expect anything extraordinary. And God is saying there is something extraordinary in the place where, where you consider to be common. In your everyday place, in, in, in the, the, the things you do every day, the things you are used to, in that place, God wants to do something extraordinary. And God is daring you to believe today. God is challenging you to believe that God can do something extraordinary in, in the midst of your commonplace. 
Whether that is your marriage, your family, your children, your workplace, your home, regardless of where it is, God wants to do something extraordinary in your commonplace. We think that in order for God to do something extraordinary, he has to bring us to a whole new different level. No, 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 no. In your commonplace, that's where God will do something extraordinary. I want you to touch your neighbor real quick. Touch your neighbor and tell him God will do something extraordinary in your commonplace. In the name of Jesus, I release this word upon you today. I declare that God will do something extraordinary in your commonplace. And and, uh, and now I bring it back to, to Ezekiel. Because the challenge for Ezekiel to believe was a different kind of challenge. It was a different kind of challenge. Ezekiel was was having a vision and he was brought in in spirit, in a vision. He was brought into this valley. Now the the context of it is not particularly important for for this message. But Ezekiel was brought to this valley, a valley of dry bones. And this was an army that was dead. An army that had stopped winning. An army that had stopped fighting. And he was exposed to this dire reality, this, this dire circumstance. And what's interesting about it is that at, at any point, God never asks Ezekiel what caused that army to die in the first place. That was never important. Put it up on the screen for us, please, Laura. Uh, Ezekiel 37 verse 1. Ezekiel 37, 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me out uh, by his spirit and set me down in the middle of a valley and was full of bones too. He led me all around them and there were a great many of them on the surface of the valley and they were very dry. So at first, God brings him around to walk around for him to have an assessment of what was going on. Number three, verse three. Then he said to me, son of man, why did these bones die in the first place? What happened to the son of man? Who made the mistake? Who caused them to die? That was never in question. That was never in question. And I, I, that would be my first question. But God never asked that. The first thing God asks Ezekiel is God, God challenges Ezekiel to believe. I don't care what happened to the bones. My question to you, Ezekiel, is can they live again? My God. <laughs> Can they live again? You know, I feel like I feel like it's 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 almost like a a dare. Like Jesus was saying to Peter. Peter, don't be afraid. It's me. Peter says, okay, bid me to come. Tell me to command me to come. And Jesus says, I dare you to come. I dare you to step out. And I feel like it's the same question he, God is asking Ezekiel. It's, it's like God brings Ezekiel to this valley Shows him around. He says, take a look, Ezekiel. You see how dry these bones are? Yeah, they're very dry. The King James says they were bleached by the sun. They were so, so, so dry. Very dry. Very many bones. It's like God is is having him take an assessment of the situation. See, you see how bad it is, Ezekiel? He's like, yeah, this is really bad. (laughs) 
It's like, is this, uh, how, how bad is it, Ezekiel? It's very bad. They're very dry. They're very dry. There are very many bones. Okay, Ezekiel. Now I dare you to believe. Can these bones live again? Can these bones live again? Whew, my God. You know, the journey of a disciple of Jesus is a journey that each day you will be challenged at a, in a different level to believe in something you've never experienced before. We didn't get to read the rest of the story, but Ezekiel seems to be even afraid to answer. He said, God, only you know. I leave it in your hands because I can't do anything about it. And then God tells Ezekiel, okay, Ezekiel, begin to prophesy. Begin to declare over these bones. And then Ezekiel begins to declare and say, bone for the bones to be reconnected again. And the Bible says that the bones come together as skeletons. And then Ezekiel prophesies again and says that flesh and muscle may grow into them. And the Bible says that flesh and, and, and muscle begins to grow and ligaments begin to grow back. And skin is, grows back into them and they become lifeless bodies. To the point where God tells Ezekiel, Ezekiel prophesy so that the, the spirit of life may flow back into them. And in, in this vision, remember this is a vision. In the vision, Ezekiel prophesies and the spirit of life is blown into those lifeless bodies and they become an army. And in that vision, that army is a symbol of the nation of Israel that would rise again in the future. And God is, is, is releasing a message, a prophetic message to the nation of Israel. But the whole thing began with a dare. <laughs> the whole thing began with a challenge. Do you dare to believe? The whole thing begins with a challenge. Maybe none of this would have happened if God had asked Ezekiel, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel would have said, no God, they can't. I don't believe they can. Or if Jesus had invited Peter and says, come Peter, and Peter would say, no thank you. God is, God is daring you to believe in something extraordinary today. Whether it's in your commonplace or whether it's something that has been dead and that you think God has forgotten about it. You've made your peace with it. You don't even want it anymore. It's dry. God is asking today, do you believe that these bones can live again? Do you dare to believe? The journey of a disciple of Jesus is a new dare every day. First, God dares you to believe you can be forgiven. then God dares you to believe you can be delivered. Then God dares you to believe you have a purpose. God dares you to believe you were not born by chance, that God caused you to exist in this season for a specific purpose. And God dares you to believe that nothing happens by chance. And that he has a purpose on every little detail of your life and your journey. Every day it's a different dare. Do you dare to believe 
That's the question of a disciple of Jesus. Do you dare to believe that God wants to do something extraordinary in your life regardless of how young or how old you are, regardless of what you know or don't know? Do you dare to believe that there is there are dry bones that can come back to life and there is a sea, a storming sea that can be tamed by the power of the word of God in your life? Do you dare to believe? Do you dare to believe? Like the song we sang earlier today. Do you dare to believe that he can give you beauty for ashes? Do you dare to believe that he can turn graves into gardens? Do you dare to believe that he can turn seas into highways? Do you dare to believe that he can give you mourning for dancing? Do you dare to believe? It's a challenge of faith. And my charge to you today, you can stand on your feet, I'm done. My charge for you today Is that if you, if you accept the challenge to believe, you'll be surprised at what God can do in your life. Not only in you, but through you. If you dare to believe. That's a challenge. A challenge to believe. I invite you today to to bring these things before the presence of God. I don't, I don't know what what. of life you are struggling with we all have our inner struggles we all have questions no one seems to have answers to but may this word find a place in your heart may it bring encouragement to you ask you something. Do you dare to believe that praying matters? Do you dare to believe that coming to this place, to this environment, that it makes a difference? Do you dare to believe that surrendering to God is worth it? As disciples of Jesus, we are dare to believe these things each day. Do you dare to believe that that leaving some things and feelings behind are the pathway to receiving real healing? Do you dare to believe? Do you dare to believe you can be forgiven and set free? Oh, come on, somebody. Set free from fear and anxiety and depression. Do you dare to believe that you can be set free from addiction? Do you dare to believe that God can step into your reality and show you what real purpose is? Do you dare to believe that God can turn it around? That God can turn it around I know it's not easy to explain. 
If you had, right after Peter got back on the boat, if you had asked Peter, Peter, explain to me, how did you walk on water? He would not have been able to explain to you. If you asked Ezekiel, Ezekiel, you said to God, you believe those bones can live again. How can they live again? I don't know. Don't ask me to explain to you why or how. I just believe it can happen. Pastor Diego, how? How can my life turn around? I don't know. I just believe it can happen. It it happened for me. It can happen for you. I believe it and I dare you to do the same. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I double dare you. I dare you to believe. I ask you, what are you being dared to believe? What are, being, what are you being challenged to believe? What are you being challenged to believe? Are you being challenged? To, what exactly is it? Is it regarding your, 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 I don't know, is it regarding your parents? Is it regarding your spouse, your children, your education, your work, your business? You, maybe you're trying to be an entrepreneur. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're watching from home. You're, you're being dared to believe something that God wants to do in your life. What are you being dared to believe today? In the middle of life, if you're seeing dry bones all around you, if you're seeing dry things all around you, maybe it's God having you take an assessment of where miracles will happen in your life. That's what happened to Ezekiel. That's what happened to Peter when God was, was, was telling him to look around, look around you. Nobody else can do anything, but I can, says God. God is challenging you to believe that restoration can come to your household. God is daring you to believe. Let me, let me say something to you. Anything you tell yourself you cannot experience, that's the challenge to believe. You know, that's the challenge to believe. When you tell me, you say, Pastor Diego, there's no way I can have a healthy marriage. My parents were divorced. God is daring you to believe. I say, Pastor Diego, there's no way I can have a healthy adult life. My dad was an addict. My grandfather was an addict. My great-grandfather was an addict. My uncles are, are, are addicts. There's no way. I'm in the cycle. God is daring you to believe. Do you dare to believe? Pastor Diego, there's no way I can be successful. There's no way. My parents didn't make it. My grandparents didn't make it. My great-grandparents didn't make it. None of them were homeowners. There's no way. God is daring you to believe. Do you dare to believe? Pastor Diego, I'm not not all about the, the spiritual religious thing. None of my friends are in church. I don't really know what church is all about. I don't, and this doesn't make, make a lot of sense. God is daring you to believe. Do you dare to believe? It's a challenge. God is challenging you today. You are in your boat and God is saying, come. If you want to experience something amazing, take a leap of faith. this moment I pray over your children who are being dared to believe right now they're being challenged to believe I 
release this word, God, into the hearts of all of those who might be fearful, who don't really know where to turn and what to do. Everything that is within them, challenging them right now, saying they can't do it, they won't do it, they can't reach it, they won't reach it, they can't achieve it, they won't achieve it. God, in the name of Jesus, that your Holy Spirit may touch every heart here today and bring the confidence in you that you can turn it around. In Jesus' name, you can turn it around. And when the moment comes, when we are faced with dire circumstances, with storms we can't tame, in the name of Jesus, when we are faced, God, with the question, are we willing to move forward? I pray that our confidence in you may allow us to take the step of faith into the unknown. Because even though it's unknown to us, you have ordained it from the beginning. The Bible says that you know the end from the beginning. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray for all of those today who are being challenged to believe. Challenged to believe something extraordinary. Challenged to believe that you can do more in their lives. Challenged to believe that this isn't it. Challenged to believe that there is more to their journey. Challenged to believe that they were called to greatness. Challenged to believe in the name of Jesus that the negative words that have been released into their lives is just an attempt of the enemy to, to, to frustrate your plans in their lives. I declare in Jesus' mighty name, God, that every challenge to believe today is accepted in Jesus' name. And that we can see your mighty work in our lives a call for for elevation for promotion a call for wonderful and great experiences in Jesus